All right, here we go. However, at that time, Galatians 4, 8, at that time, when you did not, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those which by nature are no gods. But now you have come to know God or rather to be known by God. Paul says, how is it that you turn your back to the weak and worthless elemental things to which you desire to be enslaved all over again? Look at verse 10, you observe days and months, seasons and years. I fear for you that perhaps I have labored over you in vain. Now, let me just recap. Paul has now spent chapters one, two, three, and much of four arguing, uh, well, not much of four, but the beginning part of the end, all of three, two and three. Heavy, heavy doctrine. He is teaching to them. He's sharing with them the legitimacy of his apostleship. He is teaching uh, them in reference to the um, and to the law. He is undoing the lies of the law. He is discrediting those who tried to discredit him. He is talking about the circumcision, the uncircumcision, how the law was their tutor. He has walked through the crying out of Abba Father. We talked about that earlier. I mean, uh, last week, we before last, that was good. But now Paul is at this point where he's starting to wind up his argument okay and uh and he makes some very strong statements help me lord and one of the straight statements that he makes is that verse nine but now that you have come to know god or rather to be known by god how is it that you turn back to the weak and worthless elemental things we talked about the elemental practices uh two weeks ago about the abcs how is it you turn to these weak and worthless abc things he's saying to which you desire to be enslaved all over again he says, you observe days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that perhaps I have labored over you in vain. I love the question. How is it that you turn again to weak and beggarly moments? One of the translation says the weak, the weak elements, the weak elemental things. What he's saying is, how is it that you've turned to legalism so fast? And uh, he's saying that the Galatians are not turning to a new era. What he's, what he's telling them, they're coming back to an old one. You're not turning to a brand new era, not era, E-R-A, but E-R-R-O-R. -R -R. You're not turning to a new era, new mistake. No, no, instead you're coming back to an old one, right? You're introducing the idea of works back to the relationship with God, right? And so he calls that weak. He's calling the, um, the practices of the law, uh, or you trying to practice and live by that. He's calling that a weak, era a weak old uh, a weak old mistake why are you going back to that and he calls it beggarly right or weak elements right the weak and beggarly elements and paul is using the same word for elements that we saw in galatians chapter 4 verse 3 he's using the same exact words and uh when he uses the word elemental things he talks about elements here and as christians right as believers we can place ourselves under bondage of a workspace or a cause and effect relationship with God. I want you to write that down. That bondage is really when you and I are operating in a work-based or cause and effect relationship with God. Meaning if I do this, God does this. I was talking to an individual today that was reading through Chronicles where the scripture says, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear them from heaven where he is forgive their sin and heal the land. If you do this, I will do that. That is a covenant that was still under the law. It's a promise under the law. So we quote it in today's church context. And I'm not saying you shouldn't, but the, in principle, if God heals us from heaven, he'll forget the sin. Blah, 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 blah. But in our context, Christ became the penalty for our sin. And I do think there are times when we are in a work-based mindset that we have to repent from that to come back to the truth of the gospel. But at the end of the day, it's not always a classic case of heal the sin, forgive the land if we repent. It's like there's a, because it's almost like if you do this, then I would do that. That's not the gospel. That's not the fullness of who we are. We read the old covenant to show us what Christ saved us from. We see the old covenant to see who God really is and how holy he is. We read the old covenant to understand how the people of Israel became a people. In context, certain things are written to us as Gentiles and certain things are not. And in that particular audience who he's speaking to was Israel. But if you did this, then I will do this to turn back your famine and to turn back your drought. But that's a conditional reality for them at that time for a law-based people. We're not in that covenant. So for me to appropriate that type of um, 
preaching or thought process or, or even as a promise. If my people call by my name, I humble themselves to pray, seek my faith, turn from their wicked ways. You did that when you gave your heart to Christ, right? So, so a work-based cause and effect relationship with God now is moving backwards. It's not moving forward. And you can have that covenant if you want it, but I will prefer this one over here. It's a better Ever put that in the chat. It's a better covenant than what we have now is a much better, better covenant. So he says, turn again. So Paul's showing the Galatians that they were not turning to a new era again, but they were coming back to an old one. He calls them weak and uh, NASB calls it, or I think it's NAB or maybe NIV calls it beggarly, beggarly, beggarly. So it's a weak, um, weak uh, works-based theology is what you're, you're you're going back to. It's weak. It's weak. Then he says in verse 10, let me get out of there, that you observe days and months and seasons and years. And when he says to, uh, that you observe days, months, and seasons and years in verse 10 of chapter 4, he's talking about the false teachers among the Galatians who demanded that this church of Galatians, these new Gentile believers, that they will observe days, months, seasons, and years uh, and other legalistic matters. What he's trying, what they're trying to do is they're trying to make these people Jews in the sense of now that you need to be circumcised, now you must also observe certain feasts. You must, you must observe certain days. There are certain holy months. There are certain holy seasons. There are certain holy years. They were pulling them into this legalistic slowly slipping in legalism, mixing legalism and liberalism in the same way, mixing mixing the truth of the gospel and grace, but then at the same time, handicapping grace by offering this law. And that, that's, that became the, um, the thought process for, around these, these believers. Let's keep moving. He says this one bold statement though. He said, I'm afraid for you. At least I have labored for you in vain. So Paul's fear was that this attraction for his church to legalism would mean that his work among the Galatians had amounted to nothing and would end up being in vain. He uses the word labored. You can put that in chat, labored. That word labored literally means to labor to the point of exhaustion. Paul is saying in Greek, or, uh, in, yeah, in Greek, that I fear that I have been exhausted, that my exhaustion concerning you was in vain. I've exercised all that I, I've dumped myself. I poured my life and my ministry into you and I'm afraid that it's in vain. He wants to show them uh, how hard he worked, right? How hard this, how hard he worked, right? Paul's trying to, Paul's trying to show them that, um, that the gospel, he never thought that the gospel of free grace meant laziness in serving God. I don't think he, but saying that, what he's saying is, I feel like I've I, that you you you've turned so fast. I feel like all of my labor is in vain. Like, what did I do? Right? It's in vain. And so, uh, let's deal with that in vain. Better, better still. Let's let's, let's move on. Let's move on because I, I don't want to take up too much. I want to get to verse chapter five. All right, Galatians chapter four. Let's look at verse twelve. Verse 12 says, I beg of you, brethren, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You have done me no wrong, but you know that it was because of a bodily illness, illness that I preached the gospel to you the first time. Interesting. I'm going to deal with that, I think. And that which is a trial to you in my bodily condition, you did not despise or loathe. But you receive me as an angel or a messenger of God, as by Christ Jesus himself. Let's work for a little bit. Paul says, I urge you to become like me. I urge you to become like me. I urge you to be like me. Paul knew, Morris says, Leon Morris, theologian says, Paul knew that the Galatian church, the Galatian Christians should imitate his liberty. That Paul was free in Jesus, and he wanted them to, to know the same freedom. And in that way, that they should become like Paul. Be as I am, and it's sort of to the Gentiles to become Christians in the same sense as Paul is a Christian. One who is not bound by Jewish law. Paul has said, I want you to be free like 
me. It's the statement he made in Corinthians, you know, um, I think it's Corinthians, follow me as I follow Christ. There is this boldness there that gives more credence to the statement. It's not follow me as a leader as I follow Christ. It's more or less follow me in this freedom as I follow Christ into this freedom. I want you to be like me. I want you to follow me. I don't live by this law. Follow me. Then he says, for I have became like you. Paul is saying that when it comes to legalism, I knew where you were at. I became like you. I used to live my whole life trying to be accepted by God because of what I did. That's what Paul is saying. And so I became like you and saw that it was a dead end. And what he's saying is take it from someone who knows where you're coming from in the short. Be like me now. I was like you. I want you to be like me. But then he says something that he says, you have not injured me at all. And Paul goes on to talk about his condition. Look at verse 14 again. Just work with me a little bit. He says, and that which was a trial to you in my bodily condition, you did not despise or loathe, but you received me as an angel or a messenger of God as Christ Jesus himself. Look at verse 14. He says that my, because of my physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at first, is what he says in verse 13, that his physical infirmity, he said, because of that, I preached the gospel to you at first. I want to deal with this. So Paul ends up in Galatia. And we know he worked out his messages in Arabia first, but when he gets to Galatia, we're starting to understand the reason why Paul was there is because there's some type of physical impairment in his body. Help me, Lord. So Paul is now compelled to travel to the region of Galatia because there's some type of physical infirmity that he suffered while he's on his first missionary journey. Now, Acts, the book of Acts doesn't tell us what we want to know, but we can piece a few facts together. Y'all ready for that? Let's, let's piece a few, few facts. I want you to go to get Acts chapter 14, Acts chapter 14, verse 19. I'm going to read this in the New American Standard. I'm going to take my time here. It says, but Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having won over the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. Verse 20. But while the disciples stood around him, he got up and entered the city. The next day, he went away with Barnabas to Derbe. So we can kind of understand around the timetable of the story in Acts and his beginning of his ministry in Galatia that Paul is in Galatia recovering from what happened to him at the hand of Jews, or should I say religious <laughs> Jews, or Pharisees, if you will, at Antioch, of the people of Antioch and Iconium. And we now know that he got stoned in Lystra, that these men came from another region, came to Lystra, uh, came to the city and stoned him, which caused an infirmity in him, and Barnabas took him to Derbe for him to heal. Now the scripture is clear in Acts chapter uh, 14, verse 19, that his attackers gave him up to be dead. Somehow he miraculously survived. All right, now some think, many theologians believe that this was the cause of the physical infirmity he mentions. Now, I'm gonna say something very controversial here. But Paul was already in the region of life when it happened. So his wording in Galatians 4 suggests that he came into the region because of the physical infirmity. Hmm. Fung, another theologian, says it like this. The emphatic position of the phrase suggests that Paul's original plan had been to go elsewhere, perhaps westward toward Ephesus, and that his missionary visit to the Galatians was solely due to his illness and his need for recuperation. So here's a question. What exactly was Paul's physical infirmity? Now, there's, it's all over the scripture where we see Paul says out of his own mouth, I believe it's in Corinthians, Paul says that there was a messenger of Satan sent to buffet him. And I've heard preachers oftentimes try to argue that Paul had a sexual proclivity. I, there's nothing that proves that. Um, some has said he had a belly issue. 
Some have said that he had probably, you know, uh, a sin issue. I've heard all kinds of things because the scripture does not denote it specifically or explicitly what his issue was. But this is what we do know. Some believe it was depression, and many say possibly epilepsy, or that his illness was connected with the thorn of his flesh in 2 Corinthians. We know that. I'm going to argue something that you probably never thought about before. You ready? I believe that Paul's issue in his flesh, again, this is not, this is just what I've been able to ascertain from the scripture. I wonder, like many other theologians, if Paul's infirmity was a long lasting resort of the stoning and the beating he took in Lystra. I wonder if Paul had epileptic seizures, um, maybe moments of in and out of consciousness, maybe, uh, I don't want to say that, but maybe some bowel issues, um, maybe uh, something that may have caused some type of neurological damage. Um, I'm wondering. Um, let's keep moving. So, according to Acts chapter 13, write that down, Acts chapter 13, Paul came to the region of Galatia, specifically the city of uh, Sidon, which is Antioch, from Perga to Pamphylia. That's I'll give you those notes in a minute. So here's a few things we know about Perga. According to Acts, remember Paul got stoned Acts chapter 14, but he was coming from Perga or coming from Pisidian, which is in Antioch. He's coming from this area, from the city of Perga. And um, we know a few things about Perga. Number one, that's P-E-R-G-A, P-E-R-G-A. First, it's the place where John Mark abandoned Paul and Barnabas. That's Acts chapter 13, verse 13. We know that. That the Perga is a city where John Mark had abandoned Paul and Barnabas. We know that for a fact. John Mark. John Mark. We know that for a fact. Okay. Number two, we also know if about Perga. Um, but the trials related to the physical infirmity may have had something to do with that. Okay, maybe. Here's the third thing. Perga is in a lowland marshy area. And the city of uh, the Galatian city of Sidon and Antioch was about 3,600 feet higher than Perga. There's this other thought that Paul's infirmity might have been some type of malaria that's common to the lowlands of Perga. Just want to throw that out there. But Paul says this that my trial that was in my flesh, you did not despise it. Or rejected. Now that's an interesting thing because whatever was going on in Paul's body, you can either readily see it or, you, yeah, you can readily see it or you will experience it in his time with you. It could have been a tick. It could have been, I don't know, there was something about Paul's person and the way he communicated, the way he moved, that most people in his condition at least in this season, would have possibly rejected to hear what he had to say. Uh, because I think he wasn't the greatest example of strength and power because of his physical infirmity or abnormality. abnormality. But these Galatians still received him. And um, they received him honorably. And this is why they became his children in the Lord, because they received him. And they embraced, they embraced him so much that they would have plucked out their eyes, that's what he says, and given them to him. If that could have made him better. Whew. Are y'all hearing me? These people, you just read it, right? These people love Paul so much, even in his infirmity, they would have plucked out their own eyes and had given them to Paul. He said this, which tells me there's something about Maybe a deformality. Y'all, can y'all can I can I play with this for a little bit? Y'all okay with this? Are y'all okay? None of this stuff is like um none of this stuff is like um 
it says in the scripture is, but think about the things he's saying. Let's give it context. Just this is called eisegetical. This is the eisegetical approach to the scripture, right? So we're, this is eisegesis, okay? So we're, we're allowing our, our imagination to explore within the parameters of what's written. And he makes a statement, Monica, that they would have plucked out their eyes and given it to me, Janae, if it would have made me better, if, if they felt like it could have helped me. Why would, why do I? Rachel says, I could see that person. Yeah, you can see that. Yes, definitely. But there's something readily on, maybe some type of disfigurement. Think about it like this, guys. I don't know about y'all. I got hit with a rock when I was a kid. I got hit with a pool ball. I got into a fight at the Boys and Girls Club. This boy said something about my mama. I hit him with the pool stick. He hit me with the ball. I had a black eye from the, from the pool ball. Now, I ain't gonna tell you what I did to him with that stick. But watch this. I had a momentary impairment. <laughs> I had a physical infirmity, you know, at nine to 10 years old in a fight at the Boys and Girls Club. Now watch this. You can see that on me. It was apparent. Can you imagine what it would be like if you got stoned? Sit in that for a minute, beloved. They threw rocks at you and they were like little small pebbles. These, these are rocks. They thought he was dead. Y'all are in y'all's bag. You see it? They thought he was dead. How do you whoop somebody to the point where they, where you think that they're deceased? How bloody he must have been. For the gospel. Now sit in that. For the gospel. For the gospel. For the gospel. For the gospel. Let's keep moving. So he says, you did not despise me. Uh, let me read something that Morris said. Morris, Leon Morris is a great theologian on the book of Galatians. I love his stuff. He says, obviously a plucked out eye would be a gift nobody could use. But Paul's point is that his converse had been ready to do anything for him in those early days. That's what Morris says. Okay. Another theologian says that this leads some to believe that Paul's physical infirmity has something to do with his eyes. I'm thinking it may have. Noted, Greek scholars such as West, Rendell, and Robertson believe that the nuances of the Greek text indicate that Paul's physical infirmity as an eye problem. And he says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 11, where Paul makes reference to large letters written with his own hand may also support the idea. I want you to go ahead to Galatians chapter 6, verse 11. Let's look at these clues. Galatians chapter 6, verse 11. Look what it says. Let's read it together and you can read it where you are. See, with that large letters, I am writing to you with my own hand. See, with what large letters, I am writing to you with my own hand. See, S-E-E, -E, with what large letters, I am writing to you with my own hands. I think it is strongly possible that Paul's issue might have been vision. I never believed the idea that it was a sin issue. I felt like um, he was in grace. Why would it be a sin issue? That doesn't even make sense. I felt like preachers were using that to because they had a sin issue. <laughs> um, I always knew it was a physical impairment. I always felt like there's something wrong with Paul. Let me give you what Cole said, and I'll jump into this. Cole said, those who see here are proof that Paul suffered from aflamia or some similar eye disease are welcome to do so. He says, certainly, certainly, with smoky fires, no chimneys, and oil lamps, one would expect a high incidence of eye trouble in the first century Mediterranean world. To one who has spent years poring over crabbed Hebrew tombs, the risk might be well greater. Yeah, so there are many that believe it's possible. Oh, here's the part I want to stop here. Isn't it ironic that theologians would argue or at least have conversations around the mysteries of these letters? That's what we're doing tonight. We're not doing a traditional Bible study. What does this mean to you? Well, if you don't have context, <laughs> you might make it mean a whole bunch of things that don't mean. 
So in Bible study, let's study the Bible. Let's dig in the actual Bible. Are y'all with me? Y'all feel me? Let's do that. Let's keep going. What did Rachel say? I saw him say, who Rachel? The pain of having God not heal you, but you touch. Woo! <laughs> yeah, that's a strong reality of so many people. Yes, strong reality. That God, you can't find another way to heal the sins of humanity. You got to let me die to do it. Let's move on to verse 17. Let's go to verse 17. Verse 17 says, Galatians 4, verse 17. Galatians 4, 17. They eagerly seek you, not commendably, but they wish to shut you out so that you will seek them. But it is good always to be eagerly sought in a commendable manner, and not only when I'm present with you. My children with whom I again, I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you. But I could wish to be present with you now and to change my tone. For I am perplexed about you. <laughs> okay, let's take this little bit and let's chew it. Uh, Paul talks about in the beginning, he says that the, um, in verse 17 and 18, he talks about the affection really of these legalists. And he says, they, zeal they zealously court you, but for, but for no good, right? And Paul admits that the legalists zealously court the Galatians. He's talking about um, how they can be cloaked in this warped love, but it's for no good. And oftentimes when people try to, anyway, that's a whole other story. Um, many cults, many cults in that time use a technique. It's not known as, but informally known as love bombing, love bombing. So people, when they join these cult-like ministries and whatnot, uh, the reason why they join is because they feel this overwhelming sense of, sense of community. It's, they overwhelm you in their prospective member of attention and support, and affection, etc. And uh, anyway, it's called love bombing. Be careful with that. Um, Paul says they want to do that to you. They want to exclude you that you may be zealous for them. In other words, they want to pull you away and exclude you. They don't want to make you uh, inclusive to, to others. They want to isolate you is what he's saying. They want to pull you away and isolate you and make you zealous for them. The word exclude there literally means to lock you up. Paul said they want to lock you up. They want to lock you up. That these legalists are courting you for the purposes of locking you up. Right? And legalism is almost always associated with some kind of religious bondage. All right? And Paul launches into a uh, biting polemic against his opponents here, the, 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 the legalist of... Um, Judaism, the Judaizers. I cannot say it all in Greek, but in Greek it translates to they pay zealous court to you, not in a good way, but they intend to exclude you in order that you might court them. And um, this is Paul's way of, of using this um, erotic vocabulary, if you will, to uh, to open these his last ditch effort of turning his church away from these Judaizers. Let's put it that way. Let me keep moving. But he says in verse, what is it, 18? Is it 18? Verse 19. He says, my children, with whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed to you, but I can wish to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. I am perplexed about you. He says, my children, my children. In this section of the letter, as he's getting ready to close up his argument, Paul mixes metaphors to give a powerful picture. He calls them my children. For Paul is likening himself to a mother who has just given birth to the church of Galatians. All right. And Paul says that I, I labor again, labor again in birth. And, and, and this is like this unnatural to have labor pains a second time is what he's saying. It's like I'm, I'm feeling these pains, these birth pains again and this is unnatural i shouldn't be feeling the way i felt before again with you is what he's saying and um paul is having these labor pains but this time that christ is formed in them that christ is formed in them so paul is saying i'll keep laboring <laughs> until it is christmas if you will for the galatians translation until jesus is formed in you all right, Jesus, I'm going to keep on laboring 
until Christ is formed in you. Uh, Stott, another theologian who I enjoy, he said this, he likens his pains to the pangs of childbirth. He says that Paul had been in labor over them previously at the time of their conversion, when he first got saved, when they first got saved, when they were brought to birth. Now their backsliding has caused him another confinement and he is in labor again. And the first time there had been a miscarriage, but this time he longs that Christ would truly be formed in them. So Paul's letter is just another revelation of how he is laboring with these people. All right. And you can see him saying that, that I want to change my tone. <laughs> I want to change my tone with you, but I don't trust you enough yet to change my tone. So you're putting me in labor again. I feel like I've given birth to you in your introduction and in your infancy. And now I got to do it again. I will, but Christ has to be formed in you. I want to change my tone, he says, but I can't change my tone. Um, he said, I want to be present with you, right? I want to be present. I want like to be present with you now and change my tone. Paul wished two things. He wants to be present with them. But he also wished that he did not need to talk to them as strong as he's talking to them. That's what he's saying. Their danger, he said, it's dangerous for you to leave the true gospel. So I got to use these strong words. This is necessary. All right, we get ready to close up chapter four. I'm going to read verses 21 through 31 with you, and then I'm going to close her up. Paul has one more argument. Now, like you and I, if you have a really good argument, you try not to argue at the house. It doesn't mean that's an inappropriate place to do it, but you try to have, if you're, if you're uh, an attorney, let's go that way. <laughs> if you're an attorney, you have what they call closing arguments. Paul's about to close. If you were in the Baptist church, the preacher about to tell you for the last time, as I come to my close, that means he about to tie in or she's about to tie in everything that they've been telling you for the last 40 minutes. This is when the organ, there you go, OB, this is when, this is when you put the man of God on, in C sharp, E flat or A. It depends on who he is and where his range is. This is when you hit him the first. That's when they turn the organ on, you can hear the, the bottom come on and the stuff is moving. Paul is about to come to his close. You ready? Paul says, tell me, verse 21, tell me, you who want to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? Woo! That's, that by itself is a whole bomb. Do you not listen to the law? He says, for it is written that Abraham had two sons. One by the bond woman <laughs> and one by the free woman. Now, you guys know the story. I don't have to go to Galatians for that, do I? I mean, go to uh, Genesis for that, right? We good? The bond woman, Abraham, Sarah, the baby mama drama, Sarah, Hagar. Okay, good. Good. If you don't, just go to Galatians chapter 12 and read to chapter 15 or 16, somewhere in there, and you'll be fine. Uh, tell me. You who want to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? Paul says, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the bond woman and one by the free woman. The bond woman is Hagar. The free woman is his wife, Sarah. But the son of the bond woman was born according to the flesh and the son by the free woman through the promise. Let me pause there for a moment. I'm going to pull this up in the New Living Translation and read it there. Let's read it here. He says, tell me, you who want to live under the law, do you know what the law actually says? So Paul says, do you know what the law actually says? Do you know what it actually says? The scriptures say that Abraham had two sons, one from his slave wife and one from his freeborn wife. The son of the slave wife was born in a human attempt to bring about the fulfillment of God's promise. Stop. Paul says, the son of the slave wife, which is Hagar, was a what? Human attempt to bring about the fulfillment of God's promise. Can I translate that? Works. Let's keep moving. But the son of the freeborn wife was born as God's own fulfillment of his promise, which means I didn't do nothing. God did. Let's keep moving. These two women serve as an illustration of God's two covenants. Paul is arguing, y'all. 
The first woman, Hagar, represents Mount Sinai, where people received the law that enslaved them. And now Jerusalem is just like Mount Sinai in Arabia, because she and her children live in Jerusalem, or some, oh, sorry, live in slavery to the law. Verse 26. But the other woman, Sarah, represents the heavenly Jerusalem. She is the free woman, and she is our mother. As Isaiah said, rejoice, O childless woman. You have never given birth. Break into a joyful shout, for you have never been in labor. For the desolate woman has, I'm sorry, def, desolate woman now has more children than the woman who lives with her husband. Look at verse 28. And you, dear brothers and sisters, are children of the promise, just like Isaac. But you are now being persecuted by those who want to keep the law, just as Ishmael, the child born by human effort, persecuted Isaac, the child born by the power of the Spirit. <sighs> look at Paul, look at verse 30. But well, what do the scriptures say about that? Get rid of the slave and her son, for the son of the slave woman will not share the inheritance with the free woman's son. So dear brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman. We are the children of the free woman. Let me look in y'all's face. Yeah, Rachel, you good? I feel you. <laughs> Mic drop, microphone drop. Paul has now said, if you don't get this, you're just not saved. Mic drop. So we are not the sons of Ishmael, the human effort, trying to obtain a promise, a plastic effort, a fake manufactured effort. We're the sons of the promise that came by the work of grace, the work of Christ, the work of God himself, who opened up the womb of a woman whose womb could not be opened and gave her a son through her husband. By faith. By faith. Because Abraham is the father of faith. By faith. Dale, you catch that now? Paul's preaching. So we are justified by faith. We are the righteousness of God by faith. We are healed by faith. We're going to heaven because of our faith. Not faith that heaven exists, but by faith that we have, that we are saved. We're by faith, it's by faith. Not faith in will I go, it's faith that I'm going. Well, what qualifies you? I believe it. I believe it. I believe, therefore I speak. I believe it. It's by faith. I believe it. I believe it. So when you die, you're going to heaven? Absolutely. I believe in Jesus Christ. I've given him my heart, you know, I believe it. I'm the righteousness of God. Well, you made a mistake. I sure did. I have, but hey, sin's not imputed upon me. And I have conviction every time I make this mistake. I want to live for God. I want to say something to you guys. I was telling a friend of mine the other day. I said, I think we, as pastors, not myself, but I think pastors oftentimes that have to preach hard against sin because we want to make sure people, oh my God, feared it, right? And what I've learned is if you give people a law, they're going to keep doing it. They just become professional. Um, they become professional with how secretive they can do it. So on Sundays, I see you look perfect. You're going through whole heck, right? Life falling apart. Just crawled out of somebody's bed. I mean, crawled out and came to church. And probably, probably going right back to it. Just, 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 just just was drunk up early in the morning trying to get enough coffee in you to sober up. But because you brushed that tongue and those <laughs> got your fangs looking clean, uh, we don't know that that just happened to you. Hey, sis, how you doing? I'm good. I mean, that was a wet word. It was probably for the day. I need that word. And we think you all good. Meanwhile, you're more concerned about the preacher and not the Christ that saves you. I want to impress apostle or pastor or bishop or superintendent or overseer, but I'm not thinking about Jesus. God bless the men of God and women of God, but Christ is your redeemer, not the people. Amen, amen, amen. So Paul drops the mic. 
Y'all, we have made it to Galatians chapter 5. Y'all ready for this? Look how Paul starts this fight. Paul comes out of that thing. He ends it. Microphone drop. No need to go any further with that. Paul jumps right into this thing. And uh, and Paul opens up. And he says, without a shadow of a doubt, in chapter 5, verse 1, Paul says these words. You know what? I'm sorry. I wonder if I should go back a little bit. I do want to go back just a little bit. I'm sorry, y'all. Forgive me. It's the teacher in me. Go back to Galatians chapter 4, verse 24. There are certain things that are symbolic that I just can't skim over. I, I just can't. I wanted to, but I can't do that to y'all. I love y'all. Look at verse 24 through 27. Galatians chapter 4, verse 24 through 27. Paul talks about these, which things are symbolic. Paul is going to give us a contrast between Mount Sinai and Mount Zion. And I want to, I do, I think that I need to go back to that. Because Paul wanted to be understood that he's using two pictures of the Old Testament. Hagar, Ishmael were pictures, right? Mount Sinai and um, Mount Zion are pictures, right? The two different covenants. He said these are two different covenants, right? Um, we know a covenant is a contract, an agreement between two parties. Paul goes on to talk about the one from Mount Sinai, right? which is a covenant associated with Mount Sinai. This is where the law was received. Remember, when Moses received the law, um, if I'm not mistaken, 3,000 people died that day. They were playing around um, with a golden calf. Joshua and Moses go down, and 3,000 people died immediately at the foot of Mount Sinai. That's in your Bible, Exodus chapter 19. And, and 20, you can read it for yourself. That covenant gave birth to bondage because it was all about what we must do to be accepted by God. It did not set people free. People died immediately after that. Okay. But then when the law came down from, um, um, uh, through grace, which is found in Acts chapter two, 3,000 people were added to the church. When the law was given, 3,000 died. When grace was released and the Holy Spirit, which was promised, the Holy Spirit filling 120 people in the upper room was promised. It was promised. The promise of the Spirit, when the promise of the Spirit came, help me, Lord, it, it, the filling of the Holy Ghost, or should I say the sealing, the, the, the expression of the Holy Spirit within you, whether you speak in tongues or not, that's not what it's about. But whether you do or not, the fact that you have His Spirit and grafts you in through faith and grafts you in to adoption. It's like saying, I'm my dad's son because I have his DNA. Through adoption, he didn't have us biologically, but through the spirit, we become his. Our last name is his. Our, you know what I'm saying? We, we become the children of God. We now have the same rights as, a, as an heir, right? All right, so let me just give you some a few things about Ishmael and the Isaacs, okay? So Paul does make this contrast between Ishmael, who was the, the son of the flesh, and then Isaac, who's the promise of the spirit. Ishmael represents legalism. Isaac represents true Christianity. I'll say it again. Ishmael represents legalism. Isaac represents true Christianity. The Ishmaels is the son of slavery and bondage. You can write that down. Matter of fact, write that down. Slavery and bondage is under the Ishmaels. Slavery and bondage is under legalism, right? It's born of the flesh. It comes from an earthly Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. There are many children there. Persecuting, Paul says. Inheriting nothing. They inherit nothing. And their relationship, Ishmael's relationship, is based on law keeping the way Paul is using it. But Isaac means freedom. It's true Christianity, but it's freedom. Isaac is born as the promise of God. He's a promised miracle. Instead of it being an earthly Jerusalem, it speaks to a heavenly Jerusalem. So when Ishmael had many children, Isaac has many more children. The Ishmaels is persecuting. Sons of Ishmael persecute, right? The sons of Isaac, 
were persecuted. They're, they're the ones who are being persecuted. We don't persecute anyone. We're the ones being persecuted. The Ishmaels inherit nothing. The Isaacs inherit everything. And in Ishmael, the relationship is on law giving and law keeping, I'm sorry. But in Isaac, it's based upon trusting God. Based upon trusting. Oh, you got it, John? Okay, good. Is that true that Ishmael is the father of Islam? Um, no, not really. It's not really true. I mean, there's this, there is this argument, but if you, if you understand, I guess, historically speaking, they do claim through Ishmael um, that, um, that, um, that Abraham's their father. So they believe the father of, Is of Islam would be Abraham or Ibrahim, which comes through uh, Ishmael, the descendants of Ishmael, and it was promised that Ishmael would have. But I want to argue this with you. Ishmael himself did not worship another god. Ishmael himself was introduced to the god of his father. This is where I've always had tension with my brothers in Islam is, is simply that um, we're talking hundreds of centuries, or not hundreds, I'm sorry, but uh, hundreds of years, uh, and we're talking maybe six or seven centuries after um, Orthodox Christ Christianity, if you will, right? First century church, six or, six or seven centuries later, Islam begins through a prophet Muhammad, and Muhammad is of the mindset that he is in the mountains, number one. He had married a woman who owned a, um, a seaport, I believe, and she was a wealthy woman. She, he became a widower and inherited her, her, um, her estate. And so he was in the mountains and he wrote and had fits of uh, what many people who are of that, um, not Islamic, but uh, some of my Arabic brothers in that time had wrote about him and said that they believed he was possessed by devils. Um, many of those who are, yeah, many of those who were, I hate these were Arabs because Arabs can be considered a, a somewhat of a racial tone, if you will. Uh, it's an American way of describing them. But some of our uh, brothers who, some of the men and women who lived in that area in that time, uh, writers from around the 6th and 7th um, century, uh, would write in hindsight about who he was, and many of them thought he was crazy. They said he had been possessed by devils in the mountains and wrote through fits the Quran. One man wrote the Quran. One man wrote the Siddhaq. One man wrote these books. And um, and they believed it was born out of visitations of devils. Now, this is what men who were Arabs at that time had stated about Muhammad. Uh, not a well-celebrated man. But through his religious expression, they began to persecute Jews and um, and Christians, if you will, and Islam began to grow. And uh, but just like Christianity in the hands of Europeans, oh Lord, I didn't mean to slip that out there. Well, it's true. <laughs> Once they got a hold of it, the wars began to start, and uh, and the Scottish against the Irish. Um, that's still a thing, you know what I mean? Inherit beefs and tensions. The McDonald's versus the, the, the you know, the Mick so and so versus the so and so's, the Camerons versus the McDonald's. There's still a t tension in these areas, you know, because of the, um, uh, what our, <laughs> what, uh, Eastern Orthodox Christians have done to the gospel, right? Um, there's still tension there. Oh Lord Jesus, how did I end up here? Why you ask that question? So, so no, Ishmael is not necessarily the beginner, the founder. No, he's not the founder. Now, some argue the root system to Ibrahim, Abraham, um, through that, and that's where you get that from. So people say, well, you know, the sons of Ishmael are fighting, uh, fighting, fighting Isaac, Isaac, and uh, you know, they're still wrestling, but uh, they're still fighting each other, and uh, and you can say that to some degree from. Um, a law perspective, if you will, but the way Paul is in it, using this in the first century church, Paul is saying that the sons of Ishmael are Judaizers. You see how he saw it? 
He didn't say anything about Arabians or no. Nah. He said they were Judaizers. All right. Now, Paul ends his argument. We just finished. He he drops the mic. Drops the mic. Mic check. It's a wrap. It's over. Paul shuts it down with the bond woman argument and free. It's crazy. Everybody's going bananas. This is my imagination. I'm still staying within the exegetical context, but I'm having fun with it. <laughs> Paul ends that, and Paul opens up with verse one of chapter five. We have finally made it. Paul says to them something so profound, and I'm going to read it in the New American Standard. And Paul says, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Verse 2, behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. Verse 3, and I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. Look at verse 4. You have been severed from Christ, context, if you receive circumcision, you have been severed from Christ, comma, you who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. So falling from grace is not sin. Woo! Falling from grace is falling from faith in Christ. That when I decide that I don't want to believe this, I'm going to get I'm going to move into a law perspective. That is the uh, that is the true definitive term that really um, defines what it looks like to fall out of grace. It's when I'm falling into legalism. Yes, 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 yes. Because now I have I have I have moved and slipped back into this idea that I can please Christ in my flesh. I can I can do this. I can do this. I can do this in my flesh. And you can't. You can't, beloved. You can't. You cannot. Yeah, yeah. So Paul starts off by telling them, he says, hey, stand fast in the liberty that Christ has made you free. King James says it. Stand fast in the liberty that Christ has made you free and be ye not entangled in that yoke of bondage. I love that. Paul says, don't. So when, one time I was out at, with a friend of mine at, uh, with, I'm sorry, I used to sing in a music group years ago. And uh, years ago, this is years ago. And we did, you know, Bobby Jones gospel and all that kind of stuff. Uh, GMWA and all that. Anyway, we were out of town at this retreat center for some type of youth conference thing that we went to, and uh, our group had to sing. When we pulled up, <laughs> we pulled up, yeah, Bobby Jones, we pulled up to this place, it was in the country, and they had this humongous, um, they had this humongous plower that was assigned to like this buggy type looking thing with a, with a, with a saddle on it. And then this other, well, not a saddle, but a seat on it with this other contraption that allowed you to be connected to something else. I, I didn't, couldn't explain it. I looked at it. I said, what is it? I know it goes on a horse. And it was a guy who was in our group who was very country, grew up in, uh, in uh, North Carolina, but he was incredibly country. And no, South Carolina, I'm sorry. He was incredibly country. He looked at that and said, you know what that is? I said, no. Nah. He said, in his country accent, man, that's a yoke in the bondage. I said, that's a what? He said, that's a yoke in the bondage, man. You grew up in Texas, you know what that is? I said, nah, I never seen that before. I said, yoke in the bondage. He said, yeah, that's a yoke in the bondage. He said, right there, that's the yoke. You put that around the, the donkey's, you know, the donkey's uh, mouth right there. And then this is the bondage. So it, it pulls. So when you you got to do the, you know, when you got to till and all that kind of stuff, it pulls, the donkey pulls the, the bondage and it, it breaks up the ground, all that kind of stuff. I said, oh, the donkey pulls the bondage. He said, yeah. Now he's thinking he's teaching me about some country living, and I'm getting Raymond. Cause I'm thinking to myself, that's exactly what we look like when we've been trapped in bondage. The bondage of legalism is your mouth is muzzled, Whew! and you are forced to serve when you don't have to. The yoke pulling the yoke, plowing, plowing, plowing. And many of us in our Christian walk, we plow. We plow to please. We plow through our shame. We plow through the guilt. We plow through the condemnation. And that's exactly what these Judaizers were trying to make this young 
uh, Gentile church do? They were trying to push them to a place of legalism to teach these men and women that they can earn the righteousness of God, something you're supposed to get through faith. And Paul says to them, now that I've said all of that, stand fast in the liberty that has made us free. That Jesus is that liberty. He has made, that Christ has made, that Jesus is the liberty that has made us free. And if we live in bondage to a legal relationship with God, it's not because God wants that. He, he didn't will that. God pleased with us to take his strength and walk in that freedom not to be entangled in the yoke of bondage. Paul made it emphatic. Paul used the word liberty, liberty, liberty. Not a false liberty, but a real liberty. That the freedom from tyranny or having to earn your way to God, right? That the freedom from sin and guilt and condemnation and shame, freedom from the penalty and the power and eventually freedom from the presence of sin. Woo! He says, stand fast, which means take every effort to stay in that place of liberty. I'm talking now. Paul's telling this church, I need you to take every effort, make every effort to stand in the place of liberty. Yeah. The great evangelist, I know it's worth running. The great evangelist, y'all, it's almost nine. Jeez, I got to stop in six minutes. The great evangelist, D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody, if you ever look up some of his stuff, um, I want to be careful, but it's okay to read some of his writings. Chew the meat, spit out the bones. If you have questions, always reach out to, to me and, I, and or to one of our leaders, and we'll definitely, I will answer whatever question you have if I, if I have an answer. Um, there's certain theologians I don't ever want you to read. There's one called Dake. Dake's Bible, Dake's commentary, burn it. If you own it, throw it in the trash immediately. He was a racist, bona fide racist. Anyway, the great evangelist D.L. Moody, he illustrated this point, I'm gonna read it to you, by quoting an old former slave woman in the South following the Civil War, okay? Being a former slave, she was confused about her status and ass. This is what she says. Now is I free or been I not? When I go to my old masters, he says, I ain't free. And when I go to my own people, they say, I is. And I don't know whether I'm free or not. Some people told me that Abraham Lincoln signed a proclamation, but master says he didn't. He didn't have any right to. Did y'all hear what she said? Many Christians are confused on the same point. Jesus Christ has given them an emancipation proclamation. But the old master tells them that they are still slaves to a legal relationship with God. So they live in bondage because the old master has deceived them. <laughs> yeah, the old master. And so what, hallelujah, yes. So what the enemy likes to do through false doctrine, because he knows his own perspective, is that the old master, the enemy comes in to try to pull you back into that place of bondage of legalism. And he'll do it through false religion. He'll do it through a confused Christian perspective, this uh, attainedness of a, you are really in, in, in Hebrew, Israelite type thing, whatever he's got to do to pull you back in. That's the old master talking. We celebrated Juneteenth yesterday. We, we celebrated Sunday as well. And I'm a, a, a historian slash um, um, genealogist um, by hobby, <laughs> by hobby. Um, and I'm really thinking about taking it on for, you know, for real. But anyway, um, I love doing genealogy work for people. I love helping people of color find their people. I do, I love it with a passion. And um, I was thinking about Juneteenth, 1865, June 19th, 1865, and what my family was doing. So my great-great-grandfather, his name was um, Dan Cole, Daniel Cole. 
the Cole family own my family here in Texas. I actually have a copy of the bill of sale of my great, great, great grandmother, Louisa Cole, who was sold for $800 in Beaumont, Texas. I have a copy of it from the family that owned her. Um, so with that being said, um, they, um, I was thinking about him and how in that time, from the time that Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation and the time Blacks had found out and a year and a half later, I need you to think through the reality that they had been made free 18 months prior. And so for a year, year and a half, these men and women were living under illegal bondage because they did not have revelation that they were already made free. So a lot of times in the body of Christ, there are people who are still under the bondage of the legalism of the law, right? A law that was never given to them, number one. I just want to add that. Or, or, or in a cessationist perspective that even the grace of Christ doesn't apply to them or et cetera. And they've been serving as if as though nothing has changed and don't know it. Yeah, Paul called it a yoke of bondage. Let me give you a little bit more and I'm done. So now I got a minute left. So this phrase reminds us of what Peter said in Acts chapter 15. If you can turn it if you want to. Peter says something. When, he, when Paul says yoke of bondage, it kind of reminds you of what Peter said in Acts chapter 15 about those who would bring the Gentiles under the law. He says, now, therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? The Jews themselves were not able to justify themselves before God by the law. So they shouldn't put that heavy burden of yoke on Gentiles. One theologian, Leon Morris, one of my favorites, he says, certain teachers, certain Jewish teachers of that day spoke of the law of Moses as a yoke, but they used the term in a favorable light. Paul saw a legal relationship as a yoke, but as a yoke of bondage. It is related to slavery, not liberty. This yoke of bondage, he says, does not, I'm sorry, this yoke of bondage does nothing but entangle us. We try hard to pull God's plow, but the yoke of bondage leaves us tangled, restricted, and frustrated. He goes on to say, it, was, it certainly was bondage. Jewish teachers counted up to 613 commandments to keep in the law of Moses. Even to remember them all was a burden and to keep them bordered on the impossible. Small wonder that Paul referred to subjecting oneself to them all as entering into slavery. Yeah, one, I want to open up for any questions real quick. And uh, before I let you guys go, what is your view or best advice in having uh, in dealing with not being legalistic, but not winking at things that need to be corrected? First of all, I'm glad you asked that question. That is the question that every pastor um, worth his salt has to deal with, right? Like, how do you how do you um, balance dealing with not being legalistic? but not looking at things that need to be quick. So let me just first qualify what legalism is, right? Legalism is when you put a stipulation on a person, a law around a person that says you must do this in order to please God. That's legalism. I think in our modern day urban vernacular, sometimes we'll call legalism living right. So if you say, hey man, you shouldn't post it online about you with that bottle of, of uh, Ciroc in the background. And you're like, oh, y'all being legalistic. No, that's not being legalistic. That's dumb. Don't post it. <laughs> Don't do that. So let me qualify legalism. Legalism is when you preach a, or you have a message that says you can earn the favor, the grace, the love, the righteousness of Christ because of something you did outside of faith. That's legalism. Let me just qualify that. So the question is, how do you have balance for not being legalistic? Legalism is when you try to impose that upon other people, right? Even, even on yourself. Okay, Rachel. So if you say to yourself, Hey, this is what you need to do in order to da, 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 da. and it's you earning your righteousness, you earning that, then that's legalism. Or you 
putting rules and restrictions that you say that must be on people. You, We are not allowed to put rules on people in the sense of this is how you get close to God. This is how you do this. Um, our job is to give you the word of God as a pastor. My responsibility is to give you the word to feed the flock of God of which he allowed me to be overseer. I'm going to feed you the word. I'm going to give you what God's word says about that. And I'm going to encourage you in your righteousness. And my prayer is that you will be so convinced about what he did for you that you live from that place, a life that wants to please him. Knowing that Christ has already pleased him, right? By becoming your sin so that you can become the righteousness of God, but that you yourself in your own journey will live from that place of righteousness instead of trying to become righteousness. How I balance that in my thing is winking at sin is like, um, there are things that people do that I have no idea. Let me rephrase that. Majority of what you do, I don't know about. <laughs> 97 percent of what people do, 99.999 percent of what people do, I have no idea, no idea that they're into that. No idea that they're doing that, right? And so, again, I take the pressure off of me by loving you and considering myself. And I think if everyone's considering themselves, um, that breaks down legalism in and of itself because you've considered yourself before you would take the plank out of somebody else's eye. But number two, I think that um, that um, God gives you opportunities to correct brothers in their error because you love them, right? If you see something that is shady, like, hey, man, you might not want to do that. Hey, listen, hey, man, you will and you witness. You know, let's, let's do that different. You know, there's ways you can do that. But after you do it, you take your hands off of it and you just begin to pray. Uh, I had to learn over the recent years, not to take people home with me. Does that make sense? I had to, that's why I lost my hair. Now that I'm practicing it, he hasn't brought it back, but I'm just saying it's one of those things I had to learn is to let people, let people be his. Like you belong to Christ, not Kevin Duhart. And whether you make a decision that, it's not one I would want you to make. It's not always a reflection of me. It's a reflection of your journey with Christ. So I think the balance is love people, live righteous, um, and, uh, and love them where they are in truth. And when you do share the truth, you know, share it in love. You know. I had to land there. And then I thought about the ministry of Christ, Rachel. Let me give you an assignment, okay, sweetheart? Uh, I want you to go and look at Jesus' ministry for yourself. And very few times you see him rebuke the sheep. He oftentimes were at the, he was at those church folks next. I mean, Christ used words that I don't even know a raka even means. I still haven't really found an adequate definition of raka. I figured it was like a, a cuss word at that time or something. I don't know, but <laughs> it was something derogatory, I think, when Jesus said that in his frustration. Raka. You know what I mean? We did we do it down here for jokes because we don't know what it means fully. But <laughs> Christ said a lot, you know what I mean? Or or tearing up stuff in the in the in the temple because of these guys and this the money changes and etc. Or you know, you dead men's bones, you, you, you know, you bunch of tombs, like what? Christ said a lot of, he was, <laughs> Jesus was a wild boy. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, he called him worthless, no good for nothing. You generation of vipers, you, I mean, he said, you brood of snakes. He would say all kinds of stuff about them. Uh, but I rarely heard him say anything to the people like that because of their sin. I would see, and, and he is so grace, First John, uh, John chapter 1, verse 14, he is so grace, full of grace and truth, Juan that Jesus never said to them, hey, repent before I heal you. He just healed them. Then he said, don't do that again. His ministry dynamic is not like what we see. And so, um, and even in Paul's, even in Paul's, in context, Paul's very much like Christ in his approach you know like, hey live live in this grace y'all what are you doing why do you want that covenant you can't fulfill that neither they're not even fulfilling that 
Even Jesus called him out with the woman calling adultery. What did he say to her? Where are your accusers? <laughs> yeah. She turned around like, I don't have any, like neither do I condemn you. So these, and people think that these were just regular men. They were not regular men that wanted to stone that woman. These men were rabbis like him. They were teachers of the law. They were older teachers training younger teachers. That's why the scripture says they dropped their rocks from the eldest to the youngest. These were instructors of the law. They knew this woman's caught in a very active adultery and according to Moses' law, she should be stoned. What do you say about that? Jesus responded by asking them, well, if you without sin, you can throw the first rock. They're proving to you that they can't keep the law. Teachers of the law couldn't keep the law. How do you speak to the concept of fun while being a Christian? Can you ask me that? How do you speak to the concept of fun while being a Christian? I'm not too certain I really I'll follow that question, but I would love for you to, to ask it, or you can come off mute and ask it, Christian. So uh, Christian is actually my cousin, Pop, and we were having a conversation right before our Bible study started um, about being able to have fun and still being a Christian at the same time and what people deem as fun and being able to be a Christian, a Christian, a Christian. Um, so we're just trying to figure out, like, how do you do that while still being a Christian? Because you get people who are like, oh, you can't do this. With, oh, you're a church girl, so you can't be doing X, Y, Z. What does that look mm -hmm. like? I'm going to give you a scripture real quick. Um, it is... First Corinthians chapter six. I'll read to you. Let's look at verse 12. He said, you say, I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. And even though I'm allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. Let's stop right there. So one scripture, King James says, all things are lawful, all things are edified, but this makes it make more sense. You say I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. And even though I'm allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything, just to make that make sense. New American Standard says it like this. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. So here's the thing. You can do just about anything you want to do, but it's not going to benefit you to do anything you want to do. And anything that's going to cause you, watch this, to be mastered by it is something you shouldn't in, uh, indulge in. Does that make sense? Now, in the context, they're talking about food, right? But I can apply that principle to other areas of my story or your story, whatever that looks like. He mentions food here. Let's give you an example. He says, yeah, you say food was made for the stomach and for the stomach for food. This is true, though someday God will do away with both of them. But you can't say that our bodies were made for sexual immorality. They were made for the Lord and the Lord cares about our bodies and God will raise us up from the, from the dead by his power, just as he raised our Lord from the dead. So Paul is saying, just because you can do it, don't mean you should do it. You know what I mean? So I think as it pertains to fun, have a blast, but just my rule of thumb is this. Remember two things. Somebody's always watching. And the number two is, does this glorify God? My third thing is, would I, would I do this in the presence of Christ? Those are my rule of thumbs.